Everything's on fire. Everything's on fire. Everything's on fire. Happy Tuesday and welcome back, Heat Speakers. It is an amazing night tonight. We've got a very interesting conversation to be had, one that I think that you will all enjoy, one that will be very informative, and hopefully by the end of it, you don't want to chop me uh, because I have seen all the Twitter answer. It does seem very exciting, but we've got the man with us tonight. We've got a special guest, Paul Charchian. He is, well, first and foremost, we are not worthy of hanging out with such a great innovator in the fantasy space. Uh, he is a man that if you don't follow on Twitter, you need to because he's got some great content there. He also has an innovative mind and has really made the fantasy space a better place. Uh, so, Mr. Charchian, we are glad you're on with us tonight. But tell everybody where they can find you and what you're up to. And uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. That was very nice, Brad. Um, well, I, I think the easiest place to find me is on Twitter, at Paul Charchian. You'll have to figure out how to spell Charchian. That's not It's not easy. And it's not easy to find to spell guillotine or guillotine leagues. So a lot of challenges. I think you know marketing 101 says don't do that. Uh, but yep, here here we are, and uh, I've got a tough name and a tough product. But I figure, you know what? If 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 you can figure those things out, you're probably worth you know me having a, a at least a Twitter relationship with you. So um, it, it's sort of like a, a litmus test, right? If you can't ever find your way to spell guillotine league, well. You probably shouldn't be in one. I like it. It sounds right to me. And they are a very interesting way, a new take on fantasy that I don't think people quite understand. So I'm excited for the conversation tonight because I've talked to quite a few folks in our community that are still trying to wrap their heads around it and, and trying to buy into it. So I'm excited to have you on because you are the mastermind behind it. So having you sell the community on it and inform the community will be exciting for us tonight. Yeah, uh, yeah. I will. I mean, I'll, I, it's it's pretty easy to understand, but what isn't easy to understand is just how compelling it is. Um, so here's the the gist of it goes like this: Every week we start with eighteen teams. There's no head to head, and it's eighteen teams because there's eighteen weeks. And every week, the low scoring team for that week gets chopped from the league. They're done, and their entire roster goes to the waiver wire where pandemonium ensues as everybody else <laughs> bids on what is ultimately you know, a whole draft worth of players. And you can only imagine, even at the end of week one, a good player, let's say Dalvin Cook has a, has a bad game and his owner is the lowest scoring team. Here comes Dalvin Cook from round one. And you know round two might be, I don't know, Mike Evans. I mean, just great players all hitting the waiver wire. And now the other 17 teams that are alive heading into week two have to make some really tactical decisions. Like, what do I want to give up for Dalvin Cook? You know, I've got $1,000 to spend over the course of the whole season. If I'm short a running back, I could start Dalvin Cook like all the rest of the weeks other than his bye week. So, you know, do I put in like half of my fab you know, right here in year two? Do I put in more than half of my fab? Do I, do I hold it? You know, how do I, you know, how do I plan that out? And every week, really better and better teams keep getting cut. And so better and better players keep hitting the waiver wire and a little bit like being in the playoffs and, most of your listeners and viewers have been to the playoffs at least once where any, any loss could be your last for the season. If you imagine that anxiety every single week, and that's part of what makes the guillotine league so special is that feeling that you're just, you're never totally safe. And even with 18 teams, you have like a 3% chance of being the team that gets knocked out. Um, but still, I mean, every week you got to just not finish last. And it's um, it's really it's just tons of fun. The waiver wire has never been more fun than in a guillotine league. And the anxiety level is unparalleled over the course of the season. That is the best way to put it. And I appreciate that that statement on it. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, man. How are you? And, and what's been your experience? I know you're excited about this episode because you love yeah. guillotine leagues. You said you spend most of your time on guillotine leagues more than your dynasty roster. So talk about it. Yeah. So first and foremost, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Uh, this will be year three in the guillotine league uh, for me. I believe I've, I've hung around till about week eight, the previous two seasons. All right. Um, it, it was, it was 
Interesting. You know, last year I was a Kenyon Drake last second rushing touchdown away from bidding chopped in week one. Wow. And <laughs> and I was sick watching it. And then I was just freaking thrilled after he scored the touchdown and you and you move on. And my experience is number one, drafting is ridiculously different because you you know, you're drafting in your typical 12 team league snake. You figure, you know, the top two, three, four, five rounds, you're going to have fantasy relevant assets with 17 other league mates. You're not it's right. Tight. So, it, yeah. so it, it gets really thin, really quick. And then to Paul's point, all of a sudden there's this plethora of beautiful fantasy assets on the waiver wire after week one. And you're like, how do you, what do you do? And the biggest takeaway for me is, is, you know, to Paul's example earlier, if it's Dalvin Cook and somebody drops 650 bucks of their $1,000 to get him, and I could understand why they would, that guy loses in week 10 or 11 and somebody picks up Dalvin Cook for six bucks and it makes you sick <laughs> because, because the, it's just simple supply and demand. You're down to like six and seven teams and everybody's fab budgets are lower. But that that was the biggest takeaway for me is so – I'm looking to, you know, pick up some tips and tricks on on drafting, how much I factor bye weeks into it. Uh, we got an extra week on the schedule this year. So there's teams that are going to go 14, 13 weeks without a bye. So there's a lot of things that kind of enter into my mind when I look at this format. But yeah, Brad, I, I think I was in about 20 some odd leagues last year. And uh, it was set your dynasty rosters. Good. They're good to go and just fixated on the guillotine leagues. And there was the complexity of Tuesday games and when the hell's the waiver wire this week. And all <laughs> well, that yeah, stuff was, last year. yeah. The pandemic right. uh, threw, threw things out of whack a little. A so, couple of times, so guillotine but. that I thought would just be a fun afterthought was about a seven day week job last year. <laughs> and, and it was fun as hell. I loved it. Well, and, and you think about it, that, that enthusiasm, the excitement when you get to the playoffs in a guillotine, that's every week. I mean, yeah. People got. I would think by midseason, people are pulling their hair out because you've spent so much time fixating on how to set the best lineup and and looking at the analytics and all that. Like, uh, it sounds amazing because playoffs are the most exciting time in every sport, fantasy football included. So you get that excitement every week. Uh, the the one thing I did want to talk about, though, I've I've been listening to, uh, and for those of you that listen to podcasts, just search chop guillotine and you'll find his podcast it's been very helpful and very informative the one interesting question i wanted to bring up in conversation i wanted to have is about uh the guillotine league site so you know i've seen him run through mfl and it seems like it's clunky and very difficult so what about guillotine leagues.com is is helpful to those guys who are commissioning the guillotine league as well as the owners that are running it like what do you do sure. that that really does focus on helping make that a, a smoother experience um, and I, I love the people at, at my fantasy league and right. long time friends in the industry. Great people, mm -hmm. great site. Um, all we do is guillotine leagues. So I mean, every right. single thing we do is just designed <laughs> around this format. So everything, everything you need to do around a guillotine league is meant to be simpler and more straightforward. It's all we do. Nothing else but guillotine leagues. So um, you get player rankings that are designed for guillotine leagues. Um, you you know everything from like our auto drafter is set to you know auto draft best for guillotine leagues. And just all the things that you need to do are best and easiest done if you're running a guillotine league at guillotineleagues.com. So that's, you know, it's all we do. So because we're fixated on guillotine leagues and making it the best experience possible, I, I think it makes it uh, it makes it the best the best place to go. And if if you, we run private leagues, so if you know 17 other people that you want to play with, great. And it's only two bucks a team. It's 35, it's 36 bucks uh, to run for the whole season all in. That's it, and uh, so at only two bucks, uh, two bucks an owner, that makes it really, really affordable. For private leagues, and then for public leagues that where you want to play with the other people, whatever price point you want to play at, we've got a guillotine league for it. There it is. I love it. I, I for you know for me, I I do a lot on Debbie and IDP and all these different types, and that's yeah. the hardest thing is getting people to to buy in per se and try something new at two bucks a team. That seems super affordable and and really an easy way to get people to even just try it out, you know. And then yeah. and then from there, hopefully they fall in love with it. I mean, having a playoff every week seems like it would be super exciting. So. I think for some people, just the just just the explanation, and they already sort of get that it's going to be crazy on the waiver wire, and they sort of get that. The part that they won't get, and Sully, you get it, is just the week to week anxiety. You just 
you know, I can tell you it's going to happen, but until you're living it, you won't know. And when your time does come to get chopped, and for most of us, you know, we will ultimately get chopped. It's it's hard. <laughs> you, you poured so much into it. Um, but for those that have made it, and I, I actually went back to back in one of my uh, in one of my guillotine leagues, and that's um, that is not that is not easy to pull off. I think I. I in light of the fact that the that we we only invented this a few years ago, I, I'd like to think I might be the only person who's ever back to back to guillotine league. I like it. That's a badge of honor. That it kind of is. I'm not going to lie. I mean, <laughs> it sounds like very self serving right now, but hey, you I'm know, gonna, sometimes take, you got to look. If you can't brag about your fantasy team to other fantasy players, who can you? Absolutely. <laughs> so the Mr. one part, oh, sorry there, bud. The no, one part we didn't touch on as well is if you're a successful manager in this format and you get down into those final weeks where it starts to get really interesting have fun setting your lineup with what you're going to have on your roster that sits on your bench that week yeah. that is the stuff so buddies of mine i ran the one guillotine league that i was in last year uh and two of my close friends were in the finals and both were messaging me who do i start and i was like i am not even entertaining the heat this question when you guys are looking at sitting <laughs> Mike Evans or <laughs> Stefan Diggs or like, it's just disgusting, right? Like no one would ever in their right mind have these problems, but it's crazy. It's I guarantee it. If someone plays for the first time this year, they're a guillotine league member for life. Guaranteed. It's the it's, most fun way to play. You know, you raised, you raised a topic we haven't talked about yet. If you can survive to about week, like 10, 11, You've got a fantasy team the likes of which you've never had before because 100%. you are stacked. And then if you keep surviving and you get into the, the roughly the you know the the, the guillotine league playoffs is week 14, 15, I, you know, you'll never have a team like this in any other format because nope. at that point everybody else has been knocked out and you really are. You're deciding, well, okay, am I gonna start Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen? Am I gonna start who do I bench between Dalvin Cook and Derrick Henry? And Alvin Kamara, Nick Chubb. And by the right. end, as as feeble as your team feels in week one, by the end, you're a freaking powerhouse, and you never, ever get that. 100%. <laughs> hey, uh, so friend of the show, JL, our boy's in the chat. He's got a question. He says, Charge, are we going to do an FSGA league? Yeah, we are. Absolutely. In fact, I think I got John Luke's uh, contact information while I was out there. But if I didn't, you're in. We are going to have an FSGA <laughs> league. We'll have an industry league for sure. He's, he's one of the team. good guys in this business. I'll tell you, he's, we've uh, Rota Heat and Front Yard Fantasy have uh, formed a pretty good relationship this off season, and uh, he's a driving force behind it. He's one of my favorite people out there. So awesome! You can't go wrong playing in a league with Jail. Yeah, I remember chatting with him uh, in Dallas a few weeks ago, well, one week ago, and uh, and uh, we're he's in. So yeah, and uh, to Louie, thank you for the very nice endorsement. That was mm -hmm. extremely nice of you to say. Appreciate. Yeah, that. the the chat is blowing up with guillotine leagues are great. Like everyone seems to really enjoy the experience. So, and that's you. You're the mastermind, right? So you get to take a bow and and as Rick said, self serve away. You can self serve all you want. Well, I, I do like to be clear about this when it comes up. Somebody on Twitter invented the format, not me. I've popularized it. I've named it. Uh, I've commercialized it. But uh, a follower of mine named Jeff Wood was uh, was the first person to, to to tell me about the format. And I'm like, okay, that's brilliant. And yeah. then I just kind of picked up the ball and ran with it. So I, I don't want to take credit where credit's not due on this. And um, and I had to wrinkle out, you know, iron out a lot of the wrinkles and how would how it would work commercially. But uh, but he gets credit for having for being the first person I've ever heard of that played that way. Well, there you go. So thank you, sir. Love it. You right. did a great thing, uh, Mr. Sullivan. What do you want to talk yes. about? So we, I know you said Oof. we had some news and notes. I Let's, don't care about those. Oh, it doesn't matter to you. All right. Well, hey, that, I don't think so. Then it's <laughs> your it's your world. I'm just hosting it. So I don't. We don't get this opportunity to talk to someone like Paul. So I say we keep just rambling about guillotine leagues. So I guess, Paul, I'll ask you a question. When you're sitting down and you're preparing for your, your guillotine league draft, how do you draft differently than you would a typical yeah. 12 or even 16 team redraft league? So the guillotine league is so different. And this is the, the mindset. It, it takes most people a little bit to get the mindset straight. In every other fantasy league you've ever played in, you're playing to win. And you're employing strategies to win. In a guillotine league, all you have to do is not be last right. any week. Just don't be last, don't be last, don't be last, don't be last. And so what you really are paying, looking for is not the high upside guys that you're used to mining all the time. You want the consistent guys. 
that are always going to produce as it, just one example. If we're just going to take the Browns as an example, Jarvis Landry versus Odell Beckham. You may very well be better off with Jarvis Landry than you would be Odell Beckham, but nobody in, in, in another format would ever draft them that way. But Jarvis right. Landry is the guy who's five catches and 60 yards and a touchdown every third game, um, as opposed to Odell Beckham, who is you know all over all over the place. And the reason that you don't want a lot of the high upside, high downside guys is if three of them crap the bed in the same week, you got a problem. And now you have a real chance of finishing last when all you're trying to do is not be last. And so we, uh, you, oh, you want to be drafting safe, reliable players who are in positions where things aren't going to go horribly wrong for them. And, and sometimes you can't see it coming. I mean, going into last year, Michael Thomas had been like the safest wide receiver for like four years running and everything yeah. went upside down. But a lot of the times you can, and you really do need to adapt to a, a strategy that allows you to find the safest, most reliable players that, that you can, you can put on the board. And that's, that is, that's drafting strategy. Number one is prioritize yeah. just safe, reliable players. Drafting strategy. Number two is bye weeks will kill you. There are players out there, like, for example, Green Bay's got a week five bye. New Orleans got a week six bye. Aaron Jones and Alvin Kamara are really dangerous because by week five and week six, you're probably still going to be alive, but there you may not have a suitable replacement for those guys, and that's going to be that's going to really hurt you in those weeks. And those, those early bye week guys, it's more punishing than you think it's going to be, and especially on draft day when you're like, ah, by week five I'll have – you know, I'll have, I'll have depth on my team, but you really might not. And you don't have to push a bunch of fab in on week five just because Aaron Jones has got an early bye week. So though that's another really key uh, consideration. Early part of the schedule, also very important. And so we do schedule analysis at guillotineleagues.com and, and help you try to figure out who's got the tough early schedules Really, you just you don't want to get knocked out early. You want to stay alive as long as you can. And so we really focus on early season because by midseason, half your roster is going to be new guys, and it won't matter as much. Yeah. So really, really try to try to find guys that have got a primrose path on um, uh, in in the early stage of the season. You know, first first third of the season, no bye weeks, easy schedules, consistent producers are all the things that that we try to do. Very and cool. Our, and our fearless leader does say uh, Rick is the the owner operator of Roto Heat. Uh, send him some information. He would love to help promote and make sure that we're pushing people towards guillotineleagues.com. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. I, I will try not to do it during the podcast. How's that? <laughs> well, <laughs> we've, we've wouldn't had, bother me. About to say, we've, <laughs> we're pretty laid back around here. We so, sure are. All so right. you're talking about guys like like Keenan Allen's of the world. These guys are, are guys that you would want to target more because of their consistency where normally a guy like that kind of goes under the radar, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, how about as a let's let's go Keenan Allen versus DK Metcalf, right? Yeah. You know, Metcalf gets that long bomb touchdown that looks beautiful, and he's gliding into the end zone with that Herculean body of his, mm. and the, the everything is right with the world. And the next week, he goes two catches for ten yards, and that's how you get knocked out of your guillotine league. Totally. But Keenan Allen never has those. I mean, we love high target wide receivers and tight ends and even running backs too, by the way, a great angle on running backs, the PP, the, the running backs that can add in the three or four catches a game. It just elevates their floor enough to help insulate you from some catastrophe. And, you know, just getting three catches for 30 yards. There's your, there's six points. There's six fantasy points right there. And you, you haven't had just a disaster just on those three catches. So even if that running back were to get, 12 carries for 30 yards, you still just found yourself to, you know, roughly a, a, a 10, a 10, a double digit uh, game. So that's another angle. We'd like guys to get a lot of targets because they, they tend to add safety with that, especially in a PPR format. So 58 W King says insulate you from Tyler Lockett. Yeah. yeah. Lockett was a Lockett was worse, right? That's a better example. A lot, well done. Lockett well done follower. 50 point so, week to off a cliff. So yeah. Yeah. Great point. Well, and I got to think, so these, when you're drafting a guillotine team, what are these running backs, like the duos, like the Chubbs and the Kareem Hunts of the world? How does that, as a, as a drafter coming in, how do you take something like that? Do you lean a little later with a guy like Hunt who's still going to get you something each week? 
or do you go with the chub and hope that he stays consistent? Like, wh how, what's your take on someone like that? Yeah, well, first you're touching on another another uh, drafting strategy we should talk about. You don't want guys on the same team. <laughs> you avoid guys on the same team, and especially the quarterback wide receiver hookup. Quarterback oh. has a bad game or gets hurt, and now you just now you just lost double. So mm. Mm. avoid players from the same team because they have, they hit the same bye week. And again, if they're if quarterback gets hurt, it hurts hurts the whole offense. And you know they're just you don't want you know if the whole team goes down, you don't want to go down with them. So there's that um, for running backs in split backfields, which there are so many of. Yeah, impossible to totally avoid, but you know it really does highlight you 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 may very well be better off with let's say Mike Davis, then you will be with a split backfield, a better back, but it's somebody in a split backfield. You know, Mike Davis is going to get all the work, and he, I think he's less likely to have a game where he just isn't the hot hand that week, and you don't, you know, you got to sweat whether or not he's going to, you know, he's going to be the guy that week or not. So I, I think there is, there's, there's a real strategy to just finding – Workhorse guys that might not be sexy names, and Mike Davis isn't a sexy name. Um, but the workhorse backs just don't have the don't have the same downside. And again, we're playing not to lose. So, Paul, question about Fab um, being uh, having played in a couple of these. The worst thing in the world to me is getting chopped with money in your pocket, <laughs> right? So you you get knocked out in like week eight, and you still got three or four hundred dollars of your thousand dollar budget. Yeah, it feels pretty terrible. So at the same time, you don't want to go crazy because if you can last a little bit longer, that's incredibly valuable currency. So do you have any theories on your fab budgeting and how you spend that? Or is it yeah. more specific to the player that pops up? If you if you can possibly avoid spending, do it. And you're, I'd rather go down with the ship in week eight with 400 bucks in my pocket than the alternative, which is to get to week 12 and by week 12, the team that's getting cut just lost Patrick Mahomes and Derrick Henry and Saquon Barkley and DeAndre Hopkins and Justin Jefferson and A.J. Brown. And the tight end that got cut off that team was T.J. Hawkinson. And you've got four bucks. Yep. And somebody else is sitting there with the 300 bucks and he's picking up those guys for 30 bucks a piece yep. and just crushing his roster and leaving you with nothing. You can't win that way. You have to have some money left in the bank for weeks 11, weeks 12, weeks 13, heading into the playoffs. We lock, we lock rosters in the playoffs. And so you got to have, you got to have fab at that point. So um, really it's worth, it's wor uh, you're better off. You're better off getting chopped with some money in the bank than finding yourself in the opposite position of not having any money in the bank when these astounding teams are getting cut. Uh, later on in the season. Okay, and we got some questions now. So Jaws wants to know, with guillotine leagues, is it best ball or are you setting lineups each week or do you have both options? Um, we set lineups, and I think you're really going to want to. Um, early on, the challenge is with 18 teams, your team's not very good. And at the beginning of the year, you know, there's some we, we really want to test your mettle and your ability to set a lineup when you've got you've got to make some bad choices. You know, my starting um, Aaron Troutman or Jake or Blake Jarwin because I sloughed my tight end position, whatever the case is in, in these big in when you've got at the beginning of the year. And then at the end of the year, we want to test your ability to decide whether or not you're going to bench DK Metcalf or Adam Thielen or Chris Godwin or Cooper Cup. And it's hard. You know, so, you know, we, we, we you know, a big part of this is trying to figure out who's the best manager. And with all the insanity and roster churn and everything goes with it, I don't want the computer just setting the best lineup. I want you to set the best lineup you can. I like it. And, and follow up to that, Adam wants to know, what's the best draft position? So you're in an 18-team league. Where do you want to be in that draft order? So I want to be at the beginning because you know, you're going to go 1 through 18, and then you go back 19 through 36, and if I've got, say, pick one, at least I get one 36 and 37. And, you know, by the end of the third round, it's already getting pretty thin yeah. on guys. And at least I got three star players on my roster. And that's a big, I think that's a big help. Now, that said, I won out a week, uh, I, I won a guillotine league out of the final draft spot last year. So, I mean, it definitely can be done. 
Um, but I think I want, I think I'd prefer to have three of the first 37 than to try to get say four of the first 40, whatever that would be 52 or something. Right. If that makes sense. Last yeah. year was interesting. Hey, the first two picks and probably 99% of leagues were Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley. Yeah. And, and those owners. So the following, following, Christian McCaffrey throughout the year in a guillotine league, totally different. So yeah. the owner with the guillotine, with that Christian McCaffrey did okay in week one because he ended up with a good game in week one. Yeah. Then week two comes, he's got to bench him, and you have your roster so thin then that 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 owner get got knocked out a lot in week two, week three, week four. But somebody would go, oh my god, it's Christian McCaffrey, and shove in like five hundred of his thousand fab yeah. on Christian McCaffrey. And then he didn't play, didn't play, didn't play, and that owner would get knocked out, and then. Here's Christian McCaffrey back on the waiver wire again. Some other guy would go push in 500 on Christian McCaffrey because now he's even closer to coming back. And then he wouldn't play and wouldn't play. And then that guy would get knocked out. And so by the end, Christian McCaffrey's ended up churning through like $2,000 of fab as he rotated between people's lineups as everybody kept thinking he's finally coming back and I'm finally going to get him and I'm going to have this great player and it never materialized. <laughs> That guy, that part, those poor owners, you got to kick yourself because, you know, as the owner, you have to try to get that piece because if he does come back that, you know, I mean, the consistency and the volume and the, and the production's there, but oh, yeah, that'd just be a kick it's in tough. the pants. Now the beauty of the guillotine league is unlike any other league. So you are the Christian McCaffrey owner and just through bad luck, you know, you, you're the first pick, you took the obvious first pick Christian McCaffrey. But you could make up for that immediately because in week, you know, here it is right after week one, you lost Christian McCaffrey, but you survived. Well, on the waiver wire, here comes somebody's whole draft, including yeah. the guy who had, I don't know, whatever, Joe Mixon or Chris, you know, or Chris Carson or whoever. You can just go spend a bunch of your fab and go get that guy. And now you're you're back and you've got another viable running back and you live to see another day. Only the guillotine league gives you that, gives you that kind of option. Yeah, and, and and your your statement made me think: What do you do with these guys that are coming back from major injuries, Saquon's and, and CMC's of the world? Do you still consider them the top options, believing they're going to be ready to roll, or do you get worried that is this injury going to cause you to get chopped in week one? History of injury, you've got to you know you've got to decide for yourself, guys. Uh, Brad Sully, you know, you got it. You know, Christian McCaffrey had never been hurt. Michael Thomas had never been hurt. You need to decide how much you want to factor that in yourself and whether or not you, you know, you believe that this is the beginning of the a, a cycle of injuries or not. And, you know, I think every single player is its own instance and you're just going to have to make your own your own consideration on that. But I'll, I'll tell you this much. By the first pick in a guillotine league format, I don't think Christian McCaffrey would be my selection. Hmm. Ooh, that's a hot take. I'll I tell like you, it. Well, now the follow-up question should be: <laughs> Who is it? Who is? Why not Travis Kelsey? <laughs> Remember, this is an 18-team league, and tight ends mandatory. All right, I take Travis Kelsey, who's been the highest-scoring tight end in four straight years, who doesn't miss games, plays for the best offense in football, and the guys who are going to war with it with the. 18th best tight end or he's starting Evan Ingram, Anthony Ferkster, you know, um, Hunter Henry in a timeshare, you know, guys like that. I got Travis Kelsey. That's an absolute play that you could, you can absolutely make Travis Kelsey the first pick overall in the guillotine league. And that's, what's kind of unique about that format too. I love that. I love it, but so I just posted Scott Fish's comment up on here. Last year in the Fish Bowl, I went tight end, tight end, round one, round two, thinking I was the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. I failed miserably because Kittle missed way too much time. Kelsey did keep me afloat because you are absolutely right. Kelsey is, if nothing, the most consistent tight end in football. Uh, so I don't, I don't hate the idea. I think that's really intriguing. And what that does also is it plays mind games with the other 18 owners because now they're like, wait a second. Do I need to go early on tight end and try to get one of the next best ones? Then somebody else slides down. I mean, I think it's I think it's cool because it messes with everybody and that's fun. <laughs> that, that's, isn't that what the point of fantasy football is? 100%. Messing with the other owners. I mean, really, it is. As it gets. All right, I gotta so tell you, oh, oh, I gotta right, tell right. you, it's fun for me to have Scott jumping in here first and foremost with some comments because if you're 
you know, if you're a regular listener to Fantasy Football Weekly like I am, Paul's having a little bit of trouble getting Scott on his show. So I know. Um, he, won't, he won't come on my show anymore. It's he, his show, too. It's Paul Scott's and he's show, too. Here, so. He's a co-host. Now, th- that said, and Scott's listening right now, he has already, he's already raised his hand for a show that's coming up next month, so it won't be too long before we'll have Scott back, and maybe even before then, I hope. And then once we get into the, the regular season, he's back into full rotation, which is very important to us. Love it. And I'm just poking fun. I, I, I'm course. a big fan of the show and uh, both of you. So just having a little fun. There. <laughs> and, he, and he does have a question. He says, Church, at what point in the season do you really start dropping big money on the waiver wire and guillotine? Chips all in time. If you're in deep trouble early because of injuries or ineptitude from your draft or whatever, you may have to go, you may have to push a bunch of chips in. Never, not like all, but a bunch of chips in early. But mostly, you really are trying to wait until at least halfway through the season because that's the teams that are getting cut are better and better teams every week. And that's when you want to be striking and have the money left to strike is middle of the season and after. So I like me, it. it's like, you know, week nine, week 10, week 11, week 12. That's when it's, that's when you're going to go. Because they get locked for the playoffs. So you're getting close to that, that kind of, it cuts off anyway. That makes that's sense. Right. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So uh, you may not know, Mr. Sullivan is a Kyle Pitts fan club. Uh, he's the he's the owner of it. So I had to post this comment just to mess with him. Uh, Kyle Pitts 101 to you, Mr. Sullivan, in the guillotines this year? So the beauty of that question is he also throws the A on the end for my Canadian heritage. So hey, I appreciate that. I like that. Uh, I will say this. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> I, I've been pounding the table for Kyle Pitts to be the 101 in, in rookie drafts all off season and and this road heat team has fitted me for a straight jacket with that said to paul's point earlier you're looking for consistency inside of your lineup as much as i love kyle pitts we have no idea what he's going to do on that on the field for atlanta we have no idea how he's going to be used now that julio's moved on to tennessee i think he's going to line up a lot outside and be more of a wide receiver than a tight end but I'm not going to gamble my entire guillotine life on finding out so i'll take him in a dynasty league and if he struggles who cares? I'll just slide him into my bench and, and wait for next year. But there's maybe not a next week in this format, let alone a next year. So I'll be a little safer in round one. For sure. Most of the savvy listeners and viewers to this podcast know the history of first round rookie tight ends. <laughs> Disastrous. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the average season is around three. This first round tight ends is around 350 receiving yards and three touchdowns. Yeah, and I think I mean, it was like 30 catches or something. It was yeah, it nothing is. good. No, it's it's disaster grade. The uh, I think Jeremy Shockey is the high is the, got the had the best rookie receiving uh uh year in the last 20 years at like okay. 900 yards. Yeah. And I think one tight end and I don't remember who might have had a nine touchdown season but was you know, it Evan Ingram? involved in that conversation i think ingram had a good rookie year didn't he Not yeah he was about 750 oh, yards seven. in yeah. six or seven i'm yeah. a bit of a obsessive person with this and uh, you know you go all the way back to mike ditka and he had a well he would get a, a thousand giant rookie and, season thousand and sixty one yards and 12 touchdowns in yeah. 14 games so that's amazing that's nuts um but yeah shockey's the post-merger guy with about 860 yards um, two tight ends and since going back to 2010, two fantasy tight ends or sorry, two rookie tight ends were top 12 tight ends in their, in their first year. It was That's Gronkowski it. in 2010 and Ingram in 2017. No one else has come close. So Gronk, Gronk, by the way, might've been that, uh, nine or maybe even 10 touchdown guy. Yeah. I think you are right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've got lots of, we got lots of comments. Scott says he's taking the over. On the three hundred and three pits. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh boy. Me and too. Then, uh, okay, wait, wait. Are we talking week one? Is that just the week one over? Because that the way people talk about pits, you'd think that would be the week one over under three hundred yards and three touchdowns. For totally. <laughs> It's going to be interesting to see that offense. You know, tight end. I mean, it still is the hardest position to 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 get into at the next level. I, I just struggled to think any rookie in this class is going to have that chance. And Pitts is going to have to fight double teams. I mean, he's probably the the number two target on that team right now, unless mm-hmm. Russell Gage is that guy. You know, so he's going to see double teams, and I, he never had to see that in college. So I just don't – I don't know how he's going to handle that. I mean, that's my biggest concern for him. 
The learning yeah, I, curve at the position is the toughest. It's even harder than quarterback. It's yeah. it you know it's the toughest position to learn because you need to learn how to block. You need to learn how to catch. You need to learn how to run routes. And you know, there's just it's just the nuance of that position is way more than people realize. And, and time has proven it just it just takes a it just takes years for most tight ends to get up to speed. I'm also concerned about Arthur Smith running the show there and how much more Mike Davis or running component to that offense will there be than years past, right? Like Matt Ryan's throws the ball like 625 to 650 times a year. If they were still running the same offense with an extra game, he might throw the ball 700 times this year, but I don't know if they're going to do that. But my thing with Pitts and what I like the most about him is I don't think he's a tight end. Yeah. I think Hayden Hurst is still going to be on the field on the inside and Pitts is going to be lining up all over the joint like a wide receiver. So I think his learning curve is a little bit less than the average tight end, but your points are taken nonetheless. It's uh, it's going to be interesting. Why is nobody ever talking about how Matt Ryan regressed badly last year? Never hear yeah. that conversation. I mean, if you watched much Ryan match, much of Matt Ryan last year, you saw him missing passes. He never missed before. Missing open receivers, not identifying open receivers. It, it, he was he was not the same guy, and mm -hmm. you know, and that's not. I'm not. I'm not saying it's over for him for as a career, but you you had to be troubled if you watched him because he just wasn't the same guy. And at his age, you feel like more and more of that bad play is going to start creeping in on him. And I don't know if he's going to do an Aaron Rodgers like turnaround. I don't think that's reasonable. I don't think so either. And if you look at the last two seasons and the games that uh, Julio Jones missed and you look at Matt Ryan with Julio Jones and Matt Ryan without Julio Jones, it's dramatically different. And it's mm -hmm. actually quite disgusting when you look at his stats without Julio. So here comes a full 17 game yeah, slate without, without Julio. So we'll see right. what happens. Yeah, well, and, I, and I like Ty's question in the chat. Is the move tight end position uh, that, re, uh, that Frank Reich reportedly loves for Granson a little simpler for a rookie to transition to, given a little less of that blocking responsibility? Yeah, I, potentially it is, yeah. I think that's it, if, if that's really what they're going to ask him to do, then if they're going to line him up standing in the slot, I think that that only helps him honestly, and that gives him a, that does give him a better chance. I, I, I think that's a very salient observation. Mm. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Oh, uh, our boy Joss wants to know: Is uh, the smoke about John who's struggling and can't mean more fire for Henry? It's June. Don't diss my 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 beloved John who John in June. I know. Let's I let's know. let's wait and let's play this thing out a little bit. I love John who Smith, and you can't if you're gonna if you're gonna throw shade on John who you're gonna have to at least at least wait until it's not June. He's the best wide receiver on that team, by the way. He is the best wide receiver on that team. They were right to spend all the money on on Jonu Smith in in week uh, in the first day of free agency. Yeah, they were wrong to spend another thirty six million dollars on Hunter Henry eight hours later. <laughs> not, not to mention the Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne oh, money, but that's don't that, even get yeah, right. Don't even either get here or there. That. Right. Oh, I, I mean, the biggest issue is that it's still Cam Newton chucking the ball to them. I mean. Is it is it Brad? Well, have you watched any of his throwing over the last few years? I mean, his game was always predicated on being able to to move around to make some things happen. If he's just having to stay closer into the pocket, I'm just I got concerns that he's not going to be able to utilize a guy like John who who's super athletic. I mean, he's better than he's more athletic than any of the wide receivers they have outside of Aguilar being a big play guy, you know. <laughs> So I'm I'm concerned about Cam more than anything. I like Mac Jones in this situation more, but I just don't trust a rookie quarterback in a Belichick system. Scott Fish is right. John is the best running back on that team, and he's the best <laughs> tight end, and he's the best quarterback on that team. I was gonna say maybe he could throw some passes too. Exactly. I mean, you know, John, I would I'd rather line up John at all those positions. Cam Newton is trash, and the fact that people are are making excuses for his eight passing touchdowns in 15 games to me is absurd. Let's remember he got benched. Was it three or four times? How does Bill Belichick bench you three or four times and then resign you? I do, I'm, I'm baffled by that. How can well, you be so bad to get benched by Bill Belichick? And then he decides he wants you back. And I'm supposed to believe he's going to remain your starting quarterback. No chance. I don't like it. Well, and and with one of the most accurate passes in college coming to New England, I'm I really could see it where they actually do play Mac Jones sooner rather than later. I mean, even if he doesn't have 
you know, some of the deep stuff. I mean, he doesn't need to in Bill Belichick's offense. Even if he's good in the short to intermediary passing game, he can mm -hmm. be very successful. We're not, uh, talking about, we're not still talking about Cam Newton being successful. No, no, there. Mac, Mac, Mac Jones. Jones. No, right, yeah. definitely on, not touching on that. It's, okay, so let's let's just fast forward to uh, the first the first weekend in October. Who's the starting quarterback for the Patriots? Mac Jones. I'd I'm on Mac. Who do you yeah. guys got? Yeah, I'd put my money on Mac Jones if I was betting. I will say Mac Jones by week two is the New England starter. Right, there you go. Look at how this about guy. the end of week? How about the end of week one? By Maybe. the end of the first game, the I don't know. I don't know who they. Again. I don't know who they play in week one, so I'll I'll, I'll let them have that game until I look let's, at the uh, schedule. I'm gonna pull NFL. Let's, let's put that. Let's find out who they got. Patriots. All right. Somebody, somebody in the chat will tell us actually. Yeah. So oh, Ferks, is Ferks the, the is Ferks the best value at tight end? So Corey wants to know: yeah. Is the guy who's following Janu a good value? Yeah, I got him as tight end fourteen. I think he's a I think he's a terrific value, and uh, I liked him even better when Julio Jones wasn't there. But yeah. um, you know, now with Julio there, the other side of the coin is with Julio there is that many more first downs and that many more you know opportunities on the other side of the field. You know, nobody's gonna be not that anybody's gonna be doubling Anthony Ferkster anyway. But Julio's gonna just pull a lot of coverage away from wherever Ferkster's gonna be. I think he's a I think he's got really nice sneaky upside. And remember, their former tight ends coach is now offensive coordinator um uh downing and so that's going to be you know that could end up helping Ferkster as well to have somebody is that's doing the play calling that knows what Ferkster can do intimately yeah and ty brings up an interesting point he likes everett a little bit more than Ferkster value wise everett going to seattle is a sneaky sneaky move uh I, seattle hasn't had a tight end like him in many many years so could you see yeah. everett being viable um, yeah, I can. Um, I, I like Everett, uh, and I think there's a there is a there's a little something there. Uh, but Tyler Higby to me is way more interesting, and I, I'd be interested to hear if you guys think feel that way as well. But I mean, if we're gonna, you know, Everett to Seattle's fine. Seattle's never really featured their you know their tight end in a meaningful way, and haven't in a long time. Tyler Higby's gonna get if if you combine, assuming he's gonna get most of what Gerald Everett was getting last year into into Tyler Higby. You've got a top five tight end last year. I mean, I think I think Higby to me is my favorite sleeper at the position, and I just feel like I love I just love what Matthew Stafford can do with this offense. You've got one of the two best offensive minds as coaches in the NFL with the Rams, and I now that Higby should really get basically ninety percent of the work. I think he's sitting on a nice season. Pat, Pat's get Brian Flores and the Dolphins. Ooh, oh, that'll be that'll be an interesting. No, that's one. not the easy out it used to be. That's nope. you know that could be tricky. J Javon Holland will be one of the better picks on the defensive side in this draft, and I love that he went to Miami. I'm a defensive guy as well, so uh, yeah, I, I do. That. Yeah, I love yeah. it. I love it. So that'll like be that'll be a tough one. It may be halftime, and Cam Newton's getting benched. I mean that wow. you know he could be doing a Tua and throwing five interceptions. Who knows? That's wow. that's People what sure it, made a lot he's of capable that. of that. Yeah, he's capable he of that. Yeah. I need to do some homework on Higby now because I was sort of down on him a little bit, but you know, and I thought perhaps the you know the Rams drafting was telling with some reason they drafted Tutu Atwell, which I still haven't figured out. Um, Van Jefferson's there, the signing of of uh, D Jax for probably Week One. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in that Rams offense, and I'm not really sure what that looks like. And Everett, I really like, and I've liked him since day one. Um, you know. When Higby had his blow up last four weeks of the season a couple of years ago, it was Everett who got hurt and had a knee injury and left the field that paved the way to that. Yeah. And to use the example that you used before and to, to read the tea leaves is the Seahawks offensive coordinator is the former Rams tight ends coach as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a link there. So yeah, I like that. I like Everett a lot. I think he could be the guy that finishes as a top 12 tight end that we didn't see coming this year. And I, and first there's another one of those guys but again, 9.65 PPR points a week, you're a top 12 tight end. So uh, it's not a tall order. So, you know, and look at the way that Matthew Stafford trusts tight ends. I mean, he did it all throughout his time with Detroit. Yeah. Uh, I think Higby has the potential to be in the in the top 12 uh, very easily. 
uh, quite honestly, because look at what look at what they've got on the outside. You've got their clear cut one and two with Cup and, and Woods. Van Jefferson is probably more of a guy that they're developing for future, you know, because Robert Woods is at the 30 mark. You never know when a player starts to drop off at that point. Atwell's being a smaller guy, he's more of a slot guy, very speedy and dynamic. Like I, I see what they're doing with all the skill position players. My biggest concern with that whole Rams offense is that offensive line that they're just not putting enough investment into. Matthew Stafford's got back issues, got hands. Hand issue. I mean, all sorts of stuff. You got to keep him upright. You got to protect that investment. You gave up your draft future for him. You got to keep him safe. Now, their offensive line isn't the worst, but it's certainly they needed to up it, and they really didn't put a lot into it in terms of draft capital. I mean, Atwell probably should have been a, an offensive lineman at that pick in the draft, in my opinion, at least. Um, so that's my biggest concern. But all that's the skill position you know players. What? I think, Brad, I think that's totally that's a totally fair observation. And that's probably my biggest concern as well. But I think the Rams are going to the Super Bowl. They have a chance. They have the best defense. They got the best defense in the league, probably. And I think Matthew Stafford is such a dramatic upgrade from Jared Goff that that offense is going to hum for as long as he's upright. And say what you want about Stafford, dude is tough. He will play through almost anything that he can possibly play through. So as bad as that offensive line is, I know that if Stafford has any way to play, he will play. Oh yeah, well, and and I am the Lions homer on the team. I've been a Detroit guy since. Uh, well, I had tickets when I used to live there, and I used to go see Barry Sanders run all over the place. So I, nice. I've been a big Lions fan. I love Stafford. I think this is the best chance he has to make it to a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, and and Goff never really fit with McVay. Like he's a play action guy, and I think. McVay doesn't do that nearly as much. So so Stafford is a perfect fit for what McVay does. I think Goff has a chance to bounce back with Detroit because Anthony Lynn is more of a I want to run to set up the pass type guy. So it fit both teams. It made sense. But Stafford has a good wow. chance. The toughest thing is the division he's in. I mean, that's a, a – that's a tough division. Arizona's not as easy as they used to be. Uh, Seattle is not as easy. You know, I mean, there's there's some quality teams in that division, but I do think the Rams have the best chance to make it out of it. Uh, agreed. Tough division, but I, I I just think they're a great team, and I I really believe they've been held back by Jared Goff, who I don't like in Denver, or Detroit, and I don't think he bounces back. And you know, Anthony Lynn is a weird fit for me because they're going to be losing in virtually every game because that defense is so bad. And now you've got this, you know, you got, a, you got an offensive coordinator who really wants to run to set up the pass. We can't. He's down by 17 in, in the first quarter. So, I don't know. That's, I don't, the, that's the only thing I like about Goff is he might throw 750 passes this year. Sure, yeah, volume alone. Might so, Paul, to, to swing this back to guillotine and talking about the Rams, it would be safe to assume that Stafford is probably the most cost-effective member of that offense in this format. Would you be comfortable? Yeah, yeah I mean, that, or, that, or Higby, that or Higby, yeah. I right. think. And I, I would go to war. You know, one of the things I've learned, we, we talked a lot of draft strategy for guillotine leagues earlier in the show. You can slough quarterbacks quite a ways. Um, few yeah. teams are going to be doubling up on quarterbacks anytime before like the 10th round. You can get, you just need your quarterback. Again, you're not playing to win. You're playing not to lose. I can get a quarterback like Derek Carr, who is not, he's not going to give me losses. Right. Derek Carr is going to do enough uh, and do enough almost every game where I don't, I don't have to worry about it. So, you know, that's an example of, of a guy that you can you can get late uh, that can that can help Ryan Fitzpatrick that you could get late that is going to play well enough. And we think of Fitzpatrick as having catastrophic games, but he finished he only finished outside of the top 18 quarterbacks in one third of his starts last year, which is actually a pretty good number for most quarterbacks. So um, that's. You know, I think he's I think he's even a guy that you could wait on. And yeah, so I, I just that's a that's a position you can slough and get those kinds of guys. Kirk Cousins, who is, you know, a very, very reliable performer as well. Well, that's a great that's a great thing about guillotine, which is also why I always enjoyed redrafts is that you don't have to think two, three, four years down the road. You have to think, what's this guy going to do now? <laughs> year, right. And that's and that can make it, uh, you know, you can you can wait on some of those positions like quarterback. If you want to try to roll the dice with one of these you know, guys at the end of their rope that may still have consistent production. So I I think it's an exciting uh, idea. I love I love the fact that. 
there isn't a tomorrow, but there is a tomorrow if you play your cards right. Like this, it just is a super enticing uh, league format. And if anybody in Thank the you. chat hasn't played, make sure you go to guillotineleagues.com. We are going to make sure that we have some links to it on, on the site so that you guys can get to it and in our chats and Twitter and all those things. Go over there, check it out. I do like that you have... Uh, you know, you have stats and, and rankings and stuff to help some of the newer guys like myself. If we, when we try these types of leagues, we, you know, <laughs> I, I may not just trust my gut because sometimes, you know, that ain't always helpful when you're in a one and done type situation like this. I do I hear you. And there's, there's some <laughs> truth to that. And, you know, you're talking about redraft where you're just, you're living in the moment, even more so in a guillotine league, knowing that your roster is going to be 50% different in five weeks. And so you can really even compartmentalize down to like, who's got a nice schedule for the next three weeks. And, you know, I'll go pick up this guy because I like him for three weeks and then I'll replace him with somebody better. Well, and, and, that, and, I think that's the biggest learning that I'm going to have that I will take out of this is that in previous years in this format, it was like, oh, I really like this player. And I, and I would try to acquire him via the waiver wire without really looking at the schedule that was coming up. And I think that's probably my key takeaway is – there's always that defense that sucks against the tight end or, or mm -hmm. those types of situations. So why not add those guys? And if you last and you continue on, that guy you wanted to pick up in week three is probably going to be there for you in week seven. So <laughs> probably um, yes. <laughs> I kind of like that. So that's kind of I think my biggest takeaway from all of this. Uh, when I when I go to guillotineleagues.com, Paul, I see all your leagues and I see this super chop, and I'm super interested in knowing what that is. So can you tell us what that's all about? Super Chop is for people who want to basically have more risk and win more money. Um, it's a, instead of a traditional guillotine league, which is 18 teams, and you're just trying to be the, the last one standing. Um, instead, it's 12, 12 team leagues. So you'll play in a league of 12. If you can survive through that, through the 11 weeks and be the last man standing after 11 weeks, you get cash for that. And you then go into a redraft with the other 11 winners to form a new league in the playoffs. And so you're in a playoff league with the 12 other league winners. And if you win that, now your upside is $15,000. So now we're into the kind of money where you could, that's like down payment on a house. That's, you know, you're halfway to a brand new car. You know, there's, you know, that's, that's pretty life-changing money. And that's, um, that's what we get when you're playing with 144 people feeding into the, the the prize pool instead of 18. And for those people that just want to have a little more skin in the game, want to have a little more risk, a little more excitement, uh, and a little more financial upside, we've got Super Chop at guillotineleagues.com. Done. So you're you're redrafting after week 11. All Correct. rosters are redrafting. Yep. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier that you lock your rosters. Do those leagues rosters lock, or do you continue to chop and pick up players through the playoffs? They'll um, they will continue to we we chop all the way to the end, but the rosters do lock in 15, 16, and seventeen. Very cool. Oof. Yeah. All right. Well, there is some more money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the one thing that we haven't talked about in all of this is, is there trading involved? Like do during the season, do you even do that? Yeah. In private leagues? Yes. We allow trading if it's a private league. So if the three of us, you know, get together and we find whatever 15 other people to play with and we're all trusted friends, we have the option to turn on uh, to allow trading, but in our contest leagues, we can't because of collusion. I mean, we can't have two teams totally. colluding to try to, you know, get the $15,000. So no trading allowed there. But if you play private league and you want that option on, great. <laughs> so the so the chat is blowing up. They do love uh, the super chop idea. And Rick says, take my freaking money. So uh, there, <laughs> right it, it, there, sounds like, it sounds like a, a great idea. Uh, okay, so we are getting to the end of the show. And, and if you've been seeing any of our posts and whatnot on the Twitters. We're giving away, like a lot of shows right now, we're giving away an entry into the fishbowl. One of the, by far the most exciting things of the year is being able to help Fantasy Cares and get involved with great, great people. Uh, we want to do our part by getting you in. We did something uh, even more exciting. Mr. Sullivan was so nice to ask our esteemed guest to come up with a trivia question. So we have no idea. We are not involved. Don't blame us if you don't know the answer, but we wanted to put it in, in a way that you couldn't collude with us to get the answer to the trivia question. Um, so as we close the show out, we are going to make sure that Mr. Charging gets plenty of time to talk about anything he wants to talk about, but we also 
want to give away a spot into the fishbowl. So if you have a question, put it up, say it out, and then first person to get it right in the chat, I'm giving you a spot in the fishbowl. All right. And so you just have to type it into the chat when you think you know the right answer. I'll, put, I'll give it to you in phases here. Um, and I, you might, people, I think, I think the astute listeners and participants here will probably get it pretty fast. From 2000 forward, the best fantasy season, highest scoring fantasy season was by whom? Hmm. I'll start giving a few hints here. It's a running back. 2,000 forward, most fantasy points in a season. Oh, and that yeah. is, we have a correct answer already. Let's see. That was Alex, I think Alex Maggard was the first person in. Ladanian Tomlinson, 2016, with 31 touchdowns in Sick. 20... In 20, uh, sorry, it's 2006, including 1,800 rushing yards and another 500 receiving yards. An astounding season for LT in 2006. And Two, McCaffrey uh, came close, didn't he? Uh, Christian, May, not, you know what? I don't think he did come all that close. No, I thought he up, did. Though. Not 31 touchdowns close. No, but close. I just thought his – point total was close. Oh. You know, it was um, a lot of people back then weren't even playing PPR, which would have made it, you know, but if we apply PPR to it. So he had the, he had 15 rushing touchdowns and four receiving touchdowns, which is going to, you know, so he had half the touchdown total, which isn't going to quite get there. It is. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and as Scott Fish mentioned, he, Tomlinson threw a couple of touchdowns that season as well, <laughs> which is crazy to think about. Yeah. That was not, go. what a draft for the chargers that year. Uh, when they landed Ladanian Tomlinson in the first round and Drew Brees in the second round. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> and they didn't even keep Drew Brees that long. I mean, and they I still know. looked very intelligent for that draft. So, it, yeah. wow. Well, congratulations, Alex. That is awesome. And you win. So, Al Alex, can you please drop your email either in this chat or DM it uh, via Twitter to Brad or myself? That would be yep. greatly appreciated. And we can uh, get you that invite and welcome into the Scott Fishbowl. It is truly an experience unlike any other. Do not draft back to back tight ends unless you <laughs> truly, <laughs> unless you truly want to experience a fishbowl like I do, which is uh, from the outside looking in. Hey, if they were healthy, you'd have been been much better off i i would have i would have i finally started to bounce back after the half the second halfway point of the season and by then it was too late so yeah. that's it hopefully you guys have enjoyed this deep look into all that our guillotine leagues if you have other questions oh, oh. he already he already found him look at that him. Right. scott found him and he's right. good so there you go alex Thank you, You're scott. Good, man. alex uh, cannot join my division my division's already full the dolly parton division we i are do full so he's, he's Bruno Mars is full as well, so you can't play. There might be either. room in the KISS division, so come on in. <laughs> Join the KISS army. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's been a great night. Uh, Paul, I appreciate you coming on and talking with us. I, it's been amazing, very insightful. I will tell you guys again, go find his podcast. It is very interesting. Uh, I think you will be surprised at how much good information you get on there to help you get ready for your guillotine league. So, uh, Paul, the floor is yours, my friend. Uh, feel free to talk about, promote anything you want to promote with the folks. Well, okay. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, at Paul Charchian. Uh, if you want to learn more about guillotine leagues, you can go to guillotineleagues.com. The guillotine league podcast is called CHOP, but the uh, our, our main podcast is Fantasy Football Weekly. Scott Fish is a co-host, Brian Johnson, Matt Harrison. We've been on for... Been on the radio here in the Twin Cities for it's this show's been on the radio for 27 years, and we've been a podcast for I don't know the last 10 of them or so. And we encourage you to check out Fantasy Football Weekly, as the name implies, it's uh, it's every week, so there's always something reasonably fresh in Fantasy Football Weekly. So there you go. That's the longest running fantasy football radio show there is, correct? It is. No, the show's been going 27 years. Be proud of Man, that. Man, does it drag. I mean, it's 27. It feels like it's 100. The only thing I've done for 27 years is live. So congratulations. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. 
Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. As, as always, everybody. It's been a pleasure. We, Thanks. We, we appreciate Thanks, you guys. Everybody in the chat, you've been amazing. Uh, we will talk to you again next week. We've got more amazing guests lined up in the next few weeks. We've got Sam Wallace, and we've got plenty of other great folks coming on. If you have questions for us, feel free to continue to drop them in the chat. Make sure you reach out. We've got Discord, rotoheat.com, rookiedraftguide.com if you need help with your leagues. We are here to help. We love you guys, and we will talk to you again soon. Peace. Also, right there, playlist. Hit it. Watch the videos. Do it. You want to, do it.